So now what we're going to do is we're going to begin to fix the problems we're having with exceptions in generic code. And this particular example will be the first pass at doing that, and we'll show one way to fix the problem. And the particular way we're going to look at here is what I would call a, a C++ 11 style way of doing it. And then the next thing we're going to talk about after this is how to fix the problem using a C++ 14 way of doing things. And I'll explain what I mean by C++ 11 versus C++ 14 as we go through the code. So the first thing to note here is that this version will not leak memory. And uh, the second thing is it does it in a way that does not require all that obtrusive, crazy um, machinations we were showing earlier with respect to having to insert try catch blocks throughout the code. We're not going to have to do any of that, and yet we're going to get really clean, exception safe code. And this example will also be used to demonstrate some other really cool features of C++, such as the R value references and the move semantics and the forwarding semantics. We've, we've foreshadowed some of those in our discussions about data abstraction, but now we're going to look at them in the context of templates where they get even cooler. So first of all, here's the program. And I'm going to go ahead and run it. You'll notice that I have uh, a small stack size. In fact, I probably should make it even smaller just to have like one item in it. <laughs> and you'll see why. Um, because it's going to go ahead and print a lot of diagnostics out. So let's go ahead and run the code. And whoops, maybe that's, maybe that's too small. Uh, let's go back and give it three just to see what happens. Oh. I remember why. Um, this version, this particular version, doesn't instrument anything. Um, I'll tell you, let me, let me start this whole discussion over again. <laughs> that was dumb. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is a version of this code that's going to improve upon the buggy, memory leak ridden version we looked at before. And this new version is going to do a much better job because it's going to have proper exception handling. And the way that the proper exception handling is going to work is it's going to not require littering your code with various try-catch statements. But instead, we're going to see how we can use some cool C++ patterns and idioms in order to make it work seamlessly. As you can see here, we create two stacks, stack S1 and stack S2. They're going to be the throw exception guys that we saw before. And then we're also going to go ahead and show off some copy constructor and move constructor features and so on and so forth. Now, in this particular case, there's really not a lot of need to put print statements in because this guy's not going to be instrumented to, to do much other than throw an exception when the time comes. But I'm just putting this in here as a precursor for what we'll talk about in the next example when we dive a little bit deeper into this. So what I want to show you is how to actually implement this code cleanly to be exception safe without requiring try catches everywhere. And the trick to doing this will be to use a C11 feature. And here is the C11 feature. It's a what it's called a, a holder class called unique pointer. And if we scoop over here and go look at unique pointer, we want this version, you can see that uh, unique pointer is a class that is parameterized by a couple of things which are handled sort of under the hood for you. And in this particular case, this is going to work for arrays. So we're doing array initialization. And the key thing to notice with unique pointer is that its constructor is going to go ahead and stash away the pointer array that's passed in here in this, in a field called pointer. And then it's destructor is going to go ahead and delete the item properly. And so here you can see the here you can see the constructor where we're passing in this null pointer and it stashes it away. And then down somewhere down below, let's see if we can find it. Uh, I don't see it. Oh, here we go. You can see that the destructor for unique pointer is going to go ahead and basically free the memory up. And this will actually be somewhat reminiscent of what you need to do for your assignment number one with release and reset. And we'll talk about those in a second. OK, so that's what unique pointer does. Unique pointer is essentially a holder class. You give it, in this case, an array, a pointer to an array, and it holds on to it for you. And then when you're all done, it, its destructor will 
automatically release or delete the memory. Okay, so far so good. You'll also notice a couple other things here that are important with respect to the no accept keyword used several places on the uh, move constructor, the move assignment operator, and the swap method. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit as we go through the example. Other than that, however, this code is pretty much the same as before with, with one other exception. We've added a new method called in place to go along with our push methods. These two push methods had appeared in the previous versions, but now that we've moved to templates, we can go ahead and use the in place version. And this uses a really cool C++ parameterized type feature known as variadic templates. And we'll talk more about that in a second. The INI file looks very much like we've done before. The only thing that we've really added here is we put this swap method here. And you can see what swap does is when swap is called, and I'll show you where it's called in a minute, it swaps the tops between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. It swaps the sizes between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And it uses the swap method on unique pointer to swap the pointers between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And it turns out that swapping integers or size Ts and swapping pointers using unique pointer never throws an exception. So we can safely mark swap with the no accept keyword saying this method does not throw an exception. And that's very important. Swap must never throw an exception. Now let's go look at stack. And at first glance, it'll look like stack is very similar to the version we saw before that had the bugs in it. But you'll see in a second that it's actually quite different and it's quite improved because we no longer have to worry about memory leaks. And uh, here's what happens in the construct that takes a size argument. We say new t, but what this is assigning into is the unique pointer as opposed to a naked pointer. We're not allocating a t star or a value type star. Instead, we're going to be storing it into the unique pointer. And what that means is, of course, is that we no longer need to have a destructor. In fact, if we come over here, and we look at the destructor, I mark destructor to be default. I say I don't really need to have a destructor that I'm going to fill in because my destructing semantics are now handled by my unique pointer. And unique pointer is always guaranteed to be called when the object goes out of scope and it will clean up the stack underscore data member. So we don't need a destructor anymore. We simply have the data member stack underscore be a unique pointer. And now it knows how to clean itself up which is a huge, huge improvement for reasons that will become clear when we look at the next method, which is the copy constructor. So here's the copy constructor, and the copy constructor is going to go ahead and also allocate a new T and store it into the stack underscore unique pointer, and that's good. But here's the real prize. We no longer have a problem here if the assignment operator on type T happens to throw an exception. And the reason for that is even if an exception is thrown here, the destructor for the stack underscore field will always get called and it will always go ahead and delete that dynamically allocated memory. So even though we have no destructor for the stack class anymore, it doesn't matter because the destructor of that unique pointer will do the cleanup on our behalf, which is quite a relief. Um, so when we run this code in a minute, you'll see that we don't have any problems with the uh, with the code blowing up the way we had before. Now, let's go and look at a few other methods to see other implications of this particular technique. And notice how this particular technique of using a holder, the unique pointer, does not require us to litter our code with try-catch blocks. We no longer have to figure out where to put the try-catch blocks, which is very reassuring. Here is the move constructor. And notice we've marked this with no accept, because this code will not throw an exception either. This code may throw an exception, but we don't have to worry about leaking memory because it's given so-called exception safety guarantees by the way we use the holder. Down here, what we're doing is we're going to call the release method on the parameter s, which will go ahead and change the ownership of that pointer that, that the s underscore unique pointer um, the s stack underscore unique pointer points to. It's basically going to say, transfer the ownership from the right-hand side to the left-hand side in this assignment or in this initialization and set the pointer on the right-hand side to null. 
So this is very much like your release method in your programming assignment number one, same kind of idea. So what we're doing here is we're transferring ownership over to stack underscore, which is the unique pointer on the left-hand side we're initializing. And you'll notice also, once we've done this, that the right-hand side no longer has a pointer. We've transferred it. It's now got a null value in its unique pointer. And we set the size in the top of the right-hand side to zero. So that guy has been lobotomized. It no longer has any state whatsoever. It's, it's moved the contents of the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Doesn't throw an exception, blazingly fast. And that's the code that will be run here when we do this move constructor. So this will go ahead and basically lobotomize S2 and move its contents into S4. Continuing down, now let's go ahead and take a look at the copy assignment operator. And this is where things get really interesting. If we take a look at what we had for the copy assignment operator in our previous solution, the one that I criticized roundly, let's take a look at what it looked like. Here's what the assignment operator looked like, the copy assignment operator in our previous solution, the one that was not very well thought out and was actually leaking memory. It wasn't exception safe. As you can see, it's, it's just a big jumble mess. And even though it kind of works when we have instantiations of types that don't throw exceptions, it falls all apart if exceptions are raised. And you saw trying to add try-catch blocks in there is an exercise in frustration and futility because it's hard to get it right and it still is um, cluttered. Here's the new way to do things. And the nice thing about this is this is kind of the canonical way to write exception safe uh, copy assignment operators henceforth. You can always use pretty much this exact pattern for your code when you want to be exception safe. And this is actually what's called strong exception safety. We'll talk about that later. So here's the way it works. We come in and we do the self-assignment check. So let's assume for sake of argument, we're not assigning to ourselves. In that case, we take the right-hand side, this guy, and we make a temporary copy of this using the copy constructor, this guy up here. And when we do this, we know that that will not leak memory. And we also, I'm sorry, we don't use that one, we use this one. So we use the copy constructor up here, and we know that that could throw an exception, but if it throws an exception, no memory is leaked, so that's good. So we're making a copy that's an exception safe copy. If that fails for whatever reason, we bail out, we haven't harmed the left-hand side of the object we're assigning to. Remember, with assignment, you already have an object. For example, down here, we're trying to assign S2 to S1, but S1 already exists, so we have to free up its left-hand side first. Well, by using this little trick here, if an exception is thrown in the creation of this uh, copy of the right-hand side, the left-hand side was never affected. We didn't make any changes to that whatsoever. So in that case, we don't leak memory, and we don't change the state of the object that we're assigning to. So if all goes well, we'll have a, an exception safe copy, and then we call the swap operator. And of course, here's the swap operator, and it's a no accept call. So that means it swaps the top and the size and the stack without throwing an exception, and it's very, very fast because it's just doing movement of scalars or pointers. So we know that won't throw an exception. And what that'll do is that'll take the state of the left-hand side, which is what's represented by star this here, and it'll swap it with the temporary. So the new left-hand side gets the state of the temporary, and the temporary gets the state of the old left-hand side. And then the destructor will get called on the temporary, and that will delete the old left-hand side, the stack pointer, and it'll go ahead and have the new left-hand side contain the state from the right-hand side. So automatically, we've done this cool thing. It's really short. It's way more concise and way more clear what's going on than the original code that we showed earlier that was buggy. And it's strongly exception safe. And we have no try-catch uh, blocks here at all. So kind of the perfect solution. And what's interesting is it actually took a long time to figure this out. The C++ community took years to, to realize how simple it was. And I first read about this when I read an article by a guy named Dave Abrams, who talked about this technique and the, the different exception safety guarantees. And we'll look at his article later. All right, one more thing to look at here, and then we'll kind of be wrapped up with this discussion. 
this is the move assignment operator, which is also no except, just like the move copy constructor is no except. And in this case, what we're doing, once again, is we're basically stealing the contents of the right-hand side and sticking it in the left-hand side and then cleaning up the right-hand side so it's been lobotomized. So you can see here we check for self-assignment. We copy the right-hand side top to our top. We copy the right-hand side size to our size. And then we go ahead and we do a reset. And what reset does is it deletes the current pointer. Let's see if we can find reset. So you can see what reset's going to do is it's going to go ahead and reset the pointer and then swap the right-hand side's pointer to come in and be our new pointer. And part of the reset is to delete, if any, of the state that's on the left-hand side. So that's, again, very much like your programming assignment number one, where you have a reset method that has those semantics. So what we're doing here is we're releasing the right-hand side, basically giving it the value of zero or null pointer, and then transferring the ownership to the left-hand side. And the release call there is deleting anything that happens to be there already so we don't end up with a memory leak. So again, very cool, very canonical. When you deal with these kinds of, of uh, classes, you can, you can do wonderful things uh, with this particular approach. OK. So this is illustrating how you can use these capabilities in the context of this program. And then you can see over here, we can uh, run this code. Hopefully, it'll work. <laughs> and it does indeed work. And it does a bunch of stuff. I don't instrument this code. Th throw exception is not instrumented, unlike what we're about to look at later. And uh, so we don't see a lot of what's going on in the hood. But the good news is that. Um, we get the operations after three copies, we throw an exception and we bail out. 